morning and welcome to the Green Talks. Um, there's new election rules, which means that I have to read an imprint, which is normally the thing at the bottom of a leaflet. So if this sounds a bit weird, it is a bit weird, but we're following the law. Uh, this event is promoted by Chris Williams on behalf of the Green Party, both at PO Box 78066, London SE 16 9 GQ. Um, I'll talk like a human being now. Uh, my name is Zach Polanski. I'm Deputy Leader of the Green Party of England and Wales, and I'm also one of the elected London Assembly members. For those of you who have very keen eyes, I host it tonight, the co-leader. Sadly, he can't make it, and he says a big sorry for not being here, but being Deputy Leader, I guess it's my job to deputise. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel uh, in just a few moments, but just some housekeeping, first of all. You'll notice that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, towards the end of the, the panel session this evening, I'll be taking questions from the audience. That's you guys. If you pop your question in the Q&A, people can then upvote your question. And when I look at the questions, obviously the questions at the top are the ones that are more likely to be asked. We're a very democratic party, and that's a democratic way to get involved with the questions tonight. Um, also, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat box for our moderators to answer. Those are technical questions. Please don't put Q&A questions in the chat box because they won't get answered. Put Q&A questions in the Q&A box and technical questions in the chat box. Hoping that all makes sense. Um, today's been a really, really busy day, as many of you all know in politics, with the autumn statement. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot tonight because we've got panellists. I guess all I'd say is if it was a green budget, it would have looked like a very different statement. We talk a lot about how we want a wealth tax, so the fact that the wealthiest in our society should be paying more. But I think what we were seeing both from this Conservative government and frankly from the Labour opposition was a refusal to engage with that inequality at the heart of our society. But that's all I'll say on the matter. I will introduce our guests. Um, first of all, we are joined today by Brooke Dambacher from the policy lead at Uplift. Welcome, Brooke. We also have Liam Hardy, who's a policy analyst at Green Alliance. We have Rhea Patel, who is a Green Party councillor, our spokesperson on equality and diversity, and whilst doing all of that, also has time to be the Fuel Poverty Director for Croydon Community Energy. And I'm sure she needs no introductions, but we've also got Natalie Bennett, who is one of our two party peers doing a fantastic job in the House of Lords, keeping everything uh, hopefully together. Um, so I'll start with Natalie, having introduced you like that. Um, in just 12 months, Natalie, we've seen the Prime Minister slashing climate targets and turning up rather than down the use of fossil fuels. They've approved a coal mine in Cumbria. They've approved hundreds of new oil and gas licences and given that Greenland to Rosebank oil field. Why has Rishi Sunak done this and what does it mean for our path towards ending the use of fossil fuels? Well, thanks very much, Zach, and it's lovely to be with everyone this evening. Um, the last 12 months. Um, I mean, on Saturday, I was up in Cumbria uh, at a protest with the rather nice hashtag, no time for a coal mine. And that, of course, is the new coal mine in Cumbria, um, which was originally being justified, not really justified at all, but the excuse was we needed to have this, to have the special coking coal so we could produce steel as we do now, um, in where coal is necessary for the process. Well, of course, this is a real demonstration of the utter disjointedness of anything, you can hardly call it policy, the government flailing around, uh, in that they've now also announced, um, and finally, um, heading in the right direction in terms of seal production, in terms of switching over to electric arc furnaces powered by uh, renewables, um, which don't need any coal. Uh, and so the whole justification for this is falling down. And I think certainly on the ground, the local belief was that the they're just ploughing ahead with this and the assumption that they'll never actually open this coal mine, but they'll hope to get lots of money uh, from the government in compensation. But I think there's, there's two ways of looking at this. In one way, this is really important. It matters on the global stage. The UK was the chair of the COP26 climate talks. We do have an inordinate place in the, in, in the global media landscape, in the global climate landscape. And so, as uh, Lord Adair Turner um, told The Guardian last week, um, people are going to talks with India and China, and they're saying, but look, the UK is opening a new coal mine. Why are you beating us up about what we're doing? So it does matter what's happening. But it's also worth focusing on the fact that so much of what the government's doing, you know, we are now in an hour, a year long or possibly longer election campaign. The government is performing the action of being a government, but what most of what it's doing will have no real world impact. So, for example, the King's speech, um, an announcement, we're going to every year we're going to have 
a new oil and gas round. Well, this is something that's actually more or less what's been happening. Um, it's 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 a performance of doing something, whereas actually it makes no real difference in the real world at all. So there's you know a couple of things to say. One, the government's doing real international damage. Two, a lot of what they're doing at home is pure performance. But three, I've just got to finish on reflecting on the autumn statement that you were talking about, uh, Zach. Um, it, you know, just is emerging as we talk is the extreme amount of damage the tax cuts that the government is offering. Um, it's something like 19 billion pounds a year. And effectively the Office for Budget Responsibility is saying that money is gonna come off departmental spending. Now I spend a lot of time looking at what DEFRA, the Environment, Food and Farming um, Department is, is doing. Um, and it's already unable to deliver anything like even its statutory responsibilities. We fully expect if DEFRA is supposed to be delivering a report, they will be 12 or 18 months late. If we see DEFRA cut back even more, the kind of monitoring of our natural world, the delivering of what are supposed to be occasionally vaguely positive government policies is not happening. So, you know, there's a story of the government, but what's happening doesn't really match anything the government's saying. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Natalie. I think that was a pretty brilliant introduction to a whole range of issues there. Um, I'm going to come to Brooke in a second, but I've realised for anyone who's tuning in who's maybe not as au fait on this issue, uh, Rosebank Oilfield is a new oil field, which is equivalent to 28 of the lowest income countries that are carbon emissions put all together. So we're talking about 700 million people. Um, and this is what the government have greenlit. Uh, so coming to you, Brooke, what are the government up to? Why are they doing this? Thank you. Well, I think that's an excellent question. Um, they, yeah, they certainly haven't done this for climate reasons, as you said, with the approval of Rose Bank, um, having the annual emissions of the 28 lowest income countries. That's also the annual emissions of running 56 coal fired power plants for a year. So it's just an astoundingly huge field from a climate perspective. Um, and this follows just follows the production gap report that was um, published earlier this month or last week, in fact. Um, which shows that governments are currently planning to produce about 110% more fossil fuels in 2030 than is consistent with 1.5. Um, so we absolutely shouldn't be handing out um, licenses for exploration or approving large oil fields um, like Rosebank. Um, and you know, some of the justifications we get are, are ones that are you know, economic or around energy supplies, but those also really don't stand up. Um, this isn't for lowering energy bills, which um, we saw with the Secretary of State for um, the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero last um, week, had pretty much admitting that this is not about lowering um, household energy bills, and that's because fossil fuels produced in the UK are sold on global markets to the highest bidder. Um, it's not owned by um, the UK public. Um, and they also really haven't, this isn't about securing energy supplies either. Um, after about 50 years of drilling in the UK, we've burned through most of the gas. Um, and between now and 2050, um, new licenses would provide just about four days worth of gas a year on average. 70% um, of what is left in the basin is oil and about 80% of the oil produced in the UK is exported. So this isn't about um, providing energy for homes. On the other hand, you know, policies that would support the expansion of renewables and energy efficiency, those can give us benefits on the climate, on energy importability, on securing energy supplies um, across, so across the board. Um, and so I think the recent government announcements are much more about reassuring the oil and gas industry um, than anything else. Um, and it really sends the wrong signals to these, um, because these are the companies that have you know, vested interests in um, slowing rather than speeding up the energy transition. Um, and I think that the um, offshore petroleum licensing um, bill that uh, Natalie just mentioned from the King's speech is really a, just a perfect example of this. It's essentially going to require annual oil and gas licensing rounds um, and puts two tests in place for this, but those tests have been very obviously designed um, to be passed. Um, they would supersede weak tests that are already in place. Um, and I think as Natalie also mentioned, these are um, really does nothing in practice. The NSTA, the North Sea Transition Authority, um, has the power to issue licenses when it sees fit. And there have essentially been annual oil and gas licensing rounds for much of the past decade. So I think this was more um, designed to politicize the issue. And um, sadly, we didn't see the King's speech being accompanied with announcements and measures that would actually keep people warm this winter and bring down emissions. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there, but it, it's, it's not, um, it, they're not announcements that uh, 
are a great benefit to the UK public. Thanks, Brooke. And I'm really glad at the end there that you linked that this is all about keeping people warm, because the question we hear more than anything, you know, isn't tackling the climate crisis too expensive. But as we know, actually tackling the climate crisis is a way to, to tackle the cost of living crisis. I mean, inequality crisis at the same time. I'm seeing people are putting their questions in the Q&A. Please do keep those questions coming and also upvote any questions you'd like to see asked at the end of the panel uh, discussion. Uh, Liam, I'm going to come to you for, for introductory remarks. Uh, the much wider question is, you know, what are the government up to and what does this mean for the planet? Yeah, thanks, Zach, and, and thanks, everyone, for, for having me here. Um, I'll just quickly say that I work for an environmental think tank called Green Alliance, and um, uh, colleagues of mine do um, a lot more work on the politics side, and, and my work is more on the policy research side, but I think I think we can comment on, on the politics of this, definitely. Um, we haven't talked much about fossil fuel lobbying yet, but I'm sure that there is uh, some element of that going on. Obviously, these are companies that have huge amounts of money, um, particularly in the last couple of years with, with bumper profits that, that they can spend on, on lobbying. So um, no doubt that that's a factor. But I think um, I think there's more to it as well. And I think and Brooke and Natalie mentioned that um, new new oil and gas licenses in the North Sea will have kind of no, no real impact on energy security and no real um, change uh, compared to what, what we've been doing already. Um, but maybe there's there's also possibly a, an angle which is about the balance of imports and exports. And, and as Brooke mentioned, we, we export much of our um, North Sea oil and gas. But of course, there's still tax re tax receipts on that. And um, and, and we, we make money off, off exporting it. So, um, so, there, so there's some motivation, even if it's not energy security, if it's purely financial or, or economic, to maximize those, um, those resources. Of course, if you have any care whatsoever about um, a, a safe and just climate, then then you would you would question those. But at the moment, at least our um, our regulator, the North Sea Transition Authority, has these two competing um, objectives. One is that maximise economic recovery, and the other is um, to have due regard for for net zero, which obviously, in their case, is, is a challenging um, juxtaposition. Um, but I think ultimately uh, this is all about the politics, and it's it's a desperate attempt to weaken the Labour Party. Um, you know, the, the main opposition that are polling much much better than than the Tories at the moment by any means necessary. And um, I think that that's the only thing that now drives the the exhausted uh, Conservative Party. They don't they're not really bringing new ideas to the table. Um, so when, for example, Labour said they wouldn't grant any new oil and gas licences, uh, exploration licences. I think the Tories are just trying to find this, turn this into a wedge issue and, and turn it into something that they can attack Labour with. Um, I have no idea if it'll have any effect. I don't know. I don't think it'll have any um, impact on the outcome of our next election, but maybe it's a long game. Maybe it, it, it's a play towards a new Labour government having to make a choice about either repealing, spending precious parliamentary time repealing this bill, um, this act, uh, or not and therefore kind of breaking that promise not to offer new oil and gas licenses so there could be something in there but I think yeah ultimately it's it's all about the politics and obviously it does make our journey towards a safe climate more difficult and um, not just in terms of hitting our own targets in the UK but as Natalie said um, it really weakens the green politics everywhere and, and slows the global transition um, but I would say we should uh, again just give a little bit of credit for some of the, the crumbs of of good news that that the government has um, offered. Um, so and I think we can recognise things like the zero emission vehicles mandate, um, which uh, is finally kind of making progress. Um, plus the go recent government money for decarbonising the steel industry, which um, I think is is useful. And um, where there are good things, we should. Uh, we should celebrate and acknowledge them, but of course, um, the backdrop is disappointment. Yeah, I think that's really well put, and a big shout out to the work that Green Alliance are doing, and um, particularly looking at the, the science of this and, and and making sure that politicians, frankly, are briefed with with the science as well, uh, is, uh, doing a really important role there. And um, finally, Ria, I'm, I'm so glad you're on the panel tonight, not just because you're a brilliant speaker, but also uh, people might have heard me say there's no environmental justice without racial, social and economic justice too. And your two roles, both as a quality and diversity spokesperson, but also as a fuel poverty director, pretty much encapsulate it in, in terms of how these two things intersect. And so just really for, for your um, first comments on, on what the government are up to. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think all of the panellists before have done a really good job of summarising this, so I don't really want to repeat that. But I think what I will say is that that kind of the announcements um, in, in the plans have completely highlighted the lack of political ambition, both from the Conservatives who are setting out the plan, but also from the opposition who are very kind of uncritical and don't really want to push uh, the kind of line out further in energy transition and that is what is going what we we do need for a livable planet energy transition um away from fossil fuels and to renewable energy um focusing on community energy product projects which is what i'm passionate about um from a kind of local uh, fuel uh, poverty director perspective um and there's a massive opportunity there to engage with communities and really support communities um in terms of energy uh, projects and really helping people to get more warm and healthy homes but instead the focus has been on the profits and the um kind of multinational companies that that are benefiting from it rather than you know being able to support our residents with healthy warm homes which is what the focus should be Thank you, Ria. Um, those are brilliant answers to, to the first question. As I said, please do keep putting your questions uh, in the Q&A. Also, this is a good moment to say that uh, to be on this webinar, you don't have to be a member of the Green Party, but we're always keen to see people not just voting for the Green Party, but joining too. And you can join on greenparty.org.uk forward slash join. Uh, to get people to join, though, it's always good to talk about hope. And our next question is, I think, a little bit more hopeful because it's actually what does the alternative to a fossil fuel economy look like and what are the key policies um, in making that transition? Uh, so, Brooke, I'm going to come to you first to hopefully offer us a bit of hope. What does the alternative look like? Yeah, thank you, Zach. Well, yeah, the, the, as we as we will, um, other panels have touched on, I think the fossil fuel economy looks like everyone having warm homes, having affordable energy bills, and our economy and our society being powered by wind and solar, not not by fossil fuels. Um, and this is very much possible. Um, and we've seen that set out in sort of numerous. Um, models that I can speak to a bit later, but it's really government policy that I think is holding us back at this point. We have research that shows that transitioning faster is cheaper in the long run, um, not to mention the avoided costs you have of climate impacts around the world if you transition cheaper, uh, faster rather. Um, and how we get there, I think it's essential that this is, uh, we cut both sides of the scissors. By that we mean um, that we have policies that are both bringing down fossil fuel demand and bringing down fossil fuel supply at the same time. Um, so on the uh, supply side of that equation, um, which is uh, where I tend to focus um, my work day to day, um, we need to change how oil and gas is regulated. As Leah mentioned, the North Sea Transition Authority, which is the oil and gas authority with a new a new name, um, has a mandate to maximize the economic recovery of oil and gas. Um, that remains its central sort of legislative mandate. Um, it does now have a nod to net zero um, in its strategy, but that's like a, that's a subsidiary goal in, in a legal sense. Um, and so we need to replace that mandate that's driving the decisions um, of the regulator um, with a plan to execute a just transition away from oil and gas production to a renewable energy system. Um, and part of that will also look like then the government stopping the approval of new fields like Rosebank that add to an existing oversupply. Um, and we need a clear plan to phase out oil and gas production. So we currently have the North Sea transition deal that was agreed between the oil and gas industry and the government, um, but this is really not fit for purpose. Um, we need a plan that's going to ensure that workers and communities that are dependent on the oil and gas sector are not left behind. Um, and we currently, for example, in Aberdeen are seeing the decline in oil and gas jobs, and that's not being matched by a growth that um, is commensurate um, in the in the energy sector. Um, in the, in the non-oil and gas parts of the energy sector like renewables. And then we saw today the announcement um, of the closure of the Grange Math Refinery and without a credible transition plan in place for those workers. Um, so we need, really need to address these um, policy failures when bringing down fossil fuel supply. And then on the demand side, um, we know that we can, that it's very, there's, there's pathways to show us that it's it's possible um, to bring down demand significantly um, faster and, and further than and the current government policies would have us do um, new research from 
University College of London Energy Institute that shows us that with greater policy ambition, the UK could be entirely fossil fuel free by 2045. Um, we also see sort of models like Zero Carbon Britain project, which are showing what a fossil free UK could look like. Um, and that really requires the rapid deployment of renewables and energy efficiency. So, for example, ensuring homes have basic insulation that could cut household demand by up to a fifth. Um, one sort of study shows. And another recent study which highlighted the, the issue here is that the recent um, weakening of green policies is really undermining the confidence of the renewable sector. So again, the government's not sending the right signal that I think with, it, with its current policies. Um, and the final aspect I'll add here is just that as we transition away from fossil fuels, this needs to happen globally. This is not just um, a problem that the UK needs to address at home. Um, the UK, when it by, by taking um, steps forward to phase out, um, fossil fuels can also be a climate leader and that will have ripple effects and encourage others to follow. So we need to look at policies like having the UK join the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance of countries, which is working um, to phase out um, oil and gas. And part of that is also going to be supporting developing countries um, to transition away from, from fossil fuels with the provision of climate finance. Thanks, Brooke. That was incredibly extensive. And I just wanted to amplify the point really about workers' rights, because I feel in the past their, 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 their kind of livelihoods have often been missing from this conversation and the need for a just transition. In fact, last month I was with Anthony Slaughter, who's the leader of Wales Green Party, who went to visit Port Talbot uh, to a steelworks there, because obviously we need to make sure that we're talking to workers and that unions are involved with these conversations uh, about what a transition looks like. So I just wanted to, to amplify that point in your answer. Liam, can I come to you for uh, alternatives? What does the alternative to a fossil fuel economy look like? Yeah, thanks, Zach. And I'll try not to, to repeat too much of, of what Brooks already said. But um, when I was thinking about this question, I was um, thinking about kind of four key areas. And, and in many ways, they, they overlap. But I'll, I'll quickly run through some of them. Um, and, and, and Brooke talked about kind of renewable energy and renewable electricity. And I think clean and cheap um, uh, energy is, is a huge um, electricity sorry is a is a huge part of the puzzle and obviously the sooner the better we reach a, a, a decarbonized electricity grid um uh, but even for uh, the the current goal of 2035 um a zero carbon grid is a real challenge um we need to see a huge expansion of renewables um of all of all types um huge expansion of energy storage technologies um and likely some additional technologies that so that sort of complement the renewables at the times when um, it's the middle of winter and it's not blown uh, much of a gale for a week or two. Um, and uh, they, you know, those, those technologies need to be able to provide flexible as well as firm um, power supply. Um, and I can talk a bit more about what those might be if you want, but, but that's one sector, which is the, the clean electricity sector. And that ties into some of the other sectors. So another one is, is obviously transport. Um, it's actually our biggest uh, emissions, uh, sec biggest sector of emissions um, in the UK at the moment. And the bulk of that is, is for passenger cars. Um, but, you know, we can't also, we also can't forget vans, lorries, trucks, boats, and of course, planes. Um, and much of that can, and I think will be electrified. Um, but, uh, and we, you know, we can't, we can't really move too fast in this space. We, we could, we can only go, there's no, there's no, we, yeah, you can't go too quickly. So we, we, we ought to accelerate. Um, but I think aviation and, and shipping and, and, and maritime transport are a bit of a different beast and um, electrification isn't um, the silver bullet there. There are kind of early stage solutions um, and, um, you, they need lots more work and the costs to come down. Um, and again, we can, we can talk a bit more about what this might look like if you want. The third area is heating. And I think, um, again, here, electrification is absolutely the right answer. Um, I think heat pumps are actually more important and, and more of an economic saving now than um, insulation. Um, although, you know, we absolutely should be doing more retrofit and, and installing more insulation. But I think the costs of those that in those interventions are still high, whereas the cost of heat pumps are uh, getting cheaper all the time. And I think if we can get that cheap side of electricity, then um, the savings um, are, are amplified. The fourth one I'll, I'll mention is, is industry. And I think this is often over, overlooked and forgotten about in these conversations, because unless you live next to a, a big industrial cluster, um, then it, you, you can forget that, that they're going on and that there's huge amounts of 
um, products in our daily lives that that depend on big industries. And, and we mentioned um, the steelworks. So you know, I think I think this this is a big a big factor. Um, and again, their fossil fuels are used for heat and energy, but also as a feedstock in things like chemicals. Um, so again, electrification can and will help with this. And I think there's a there's a gap at the moment from in government policy. Um, uh, but uh, but also industry might be one of those places where um, that is suitable for the precious use of low carbon hydrogen, um, which again, I'm happy to talk on in, in more detail about if, if people want to. But I will just just say that so much of our modern society does depend on um, on chemicals and the vast majority of those chemicals are made from carbon that comes from fossil fuels. So that's one of those examples of um, a place where it's it's really quite tricky to get to get out of that, and um, all of the alternatives have difficult trade-offs. Um, so, uh, and and although we we absolutely should be reducing our use of those products as much as possible, that's never going to to go away completely. So this might be one of those areas where the use of fossil fuels might continue beyond 2050. Um, I hope we'll be able to phase them out completely at some point, but I just don't. It's hard to see how we can be ready for that. Um, uh, by 2050, because those alternatives just just aren't there. I could talk more about the policies that are in place or that aren't in place about all of those different sectors, but I, I think I'll pause because I've talked for ages. Thanks. I know we could ask you lots of questions, Liam, on this case. You have a mass amount of knowledge. I'm sure things will will come up in the questions. Uh, just before I'm going to come to rear, I'm going to uh, abuse chair's privilege possibly. Uh, so I've chaired the Environment Committee in London for the last couple of years, and retrofit is something that I've been pushing the mayor on quite heavily to retrofit every home in London, indeed in the UK nationally, that needs it. We know that's a triple win because it reduces emissions, it reduces bills, and it creates good green jobs. So I'm going to pop in the chat one of the reports uh, that I've recently published, looking at what we should have been a retrofit revolution in London that's not quite worked. And I feel like it's not worked because we don't have the people skilled enough to actually do the retrofit. And I think that's something we, we should all keep an eye on. Uh, having said that, Ria, uh, so if I can come uh, to you, what policies uh, can fast track uh, this transition? Yeah, absolutely. Just want to pick up on what you just mentioned there. You've been doing really good work at London Assembly level on this. Um, but key there is that we just don't have the people who are skilled in retrofitting and um, these types of projects that we really should be encouraging kind of um, within our local areas. So if we work with um, colleges, for example, to, to, to make sure that they are taking up these opportunities to educate students in in retrofitting because there's a massive skills gap and we are going to need to retrofit more and more and um, but before we get to retrofitting the the first step i guess would be to build um uh the houses or uh buildings that we're building to a low carbon kind of standard a passive house standard and i think that's something that we really should be considering more as well at a kind of local level um there's also a massive gap in terms of the political will. I think that we've we've seen this, um, like I mentioned in the answer to my first question with the, the statement that was released in the King's speech, um, and the lack of ambition is is a major kind of you know, it gives major resistance to to some change happening. We've seen a, a really good um, campaign by uh, Power of People on um the kind of uh, community energy side of things and improving policy gaps within uh community energy um and it's gained cross-party support um and a, a bill has been tabled and yet still um it's it's been there's been stalls kind of in taking that forward even further and making sure that it actually does get passed in, as an act and become government policy and so there's 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 something there in terms of what we can be doing um, as Greens to push for better uh, support for community energy projects, um, which we we have been doing to need to do. Um, Brooke also mentioned about green transition, which I think is really important. And Zach, you picked up on that as well and supporting those workers who are in industries um, who will be uh, impacted by a transition to a more ca climate carbon friendly uh, climate friendly low carbon kind of society and one of the groups that I met with called safe landing is a group of aviation workers um, who are keen to transition their, their jobs and are aware of the impact that the aviation industry is having on the climate um, and so have self-organized themselves to 
to start these discussions about what a green transition could look like within the aviation industry, which I think is great, um, great to see. Um, and there kind of needs to be more of that and more support for from that from politic for that from politicians across different industries. Um, and this also links, as as Brooke was saying, to globally. So um how can we lead in the UK that where others can follow? But when we are leading, how um, do our actions impact on countries globally? So if we think about, for example, uh, solar panels, so making sure that the components for solar panels are being ethically sourced um, and aren't having um, knock on effects in terms of the, the components um, in being involved in things like uh, slave type uh, conditions of work. Um, so minerals and elements like cobalt and lithium often um, are mined by workers who um, don't work in good conditions and are underpaid. And so how can we um, be leading the way and making sure that we are pushing for products which absolutely benefit the green transition, but are also looking out for people globally um, at the same time? Thank you, Ria. That was brilliant. Um... I know nothing sets Natalie off like community energy. So Natalie, feel free to talk about community energy or anything you want. The floor is yours. OK, well, actually, just to mention on community energy that um, uh, I actually started in the Energy Bill, now Energy Act, um, the amendments that were uh, written by um, Community Energy England to actually enable answering some of the questions and comments in the chat to enable local communities to generate their own energy and sell it at the local price to local people. Um, we actually made some progress on that. We eventually got in the kind of, it was the last amendment by the House of Lords standing in the energy bill. We lost it in the end, but the government had to promise they're doing a review, which is the government's way of doing nothing, but at least acknowledging they're in the wrong really. So um, pushing that and we'll keep, we'll keep pushing and I'm sure we will get there eventually. But I, I did ask Zach if I could go last on this one, because I entirely agree with what everything that's been said about the need to transition our energy system to renewables, need for a just transition, et cetera. Uh, but I wanted to add, and, and also, because the, the current economic and social system that we have has been built on that massive supply, that massive flood of fossil fuels coming in over the past couple of centuries. And we cannot go towards business as usual with added technology. One of the obvious areas of this is uh, electric vehicles. Um, you know, we're not talking about anything like a one-for-one -one replacement of electric vehicles for um, uh, oil and for petrol and, and diesel cars. Because if we think about what that would do in terms of the resource use, resources that need to go to other things, the kind of resources that Ria was talking about, the difficulties we have with mining them. So what we also need to think about is social innovation. And this is where I think you know, other parties talk about business as usual with added technology. They talk about the solar panels. They talk about the electric cars. We talk about transforming our society so it works for people and planet within the physical limits. And if you think about what some of those social innovation things are, things like a four-day working week as standard with no loss of pay, then that reduces our need for people to travel uh, to work. It reduces perhaps, you know, consumption of, of production of clothing for people to wear to work, heating, uh, of lighting of offices, all kinds of ways in which that can reduce our energy demand and start to really reshape our society. Universal basic income is another way, really exciting way of thinking about how we actually build a different kind of society that has less demand for energy, but actually gives people a better quality of life. And this is where I'm going to put in my little advert. I'm only going to do this once, but uh, I'm going to hold, hold up to the, to the camera. I have a book coming out uh, in April, but you can uh, already pre-buy your copy. And I'm going to stick a link in the, uh, the chat now. And, you know, there's a serious point to be made here because um, the, the title of this is Change Everything. And the subtitle is now How We Can Rethink, Repair and Rebuild Our Society. And I often ask audiences to sort of run a thought experiment. Imagine we'd created a wonderful society in which everyone who wanted it had a secure, well-paid job. Everyone had a secure, affordable home, could put good, healthy food on the table every day, keep the roof over their head. Um, we had really low levels of physical and mental ill health. Imagine you're in that situation and then discovered that you had a climate emergency and you had to say to everyone, right, we're going to have to change everything. Now, that would be really politically difficult. What we have to do is get across the idea that the kind of changes we're talking about to our energy system, to our energy supplies, ending the use of fossil fuels, 
gives us cleaner air, preserves the natural world, gives people a better quality of life. Um, and so we've got to, it's really important that we paint that picture, that we're not just talking about living just like you do now, but with solar panels on the roof and an electric car in the garage. We're talking about transformation that produces something much better, different for everybody. And so tying together the social innovations, changing our economy and society, as well as changing the physical infrastructure, I think is really important. Thanks. Thanks, Natalie. That's really exciting. And I think that really does set us out as a different political party, is that holistic, transformative vision of what a better society would look like. I do want to plug my report at this point on universal basic income, but I won't put it in the chat. We're just bombarding everyone with links, and I'll just re-promote Natalie's book. That's Change Everything, uh, and the link is in the chat for that now. Um, we've got a couple more questions. I'm going to turn to audience questions. Just a final reminder to pop any questions in the Q&A, or if you don't want to come up with a question yourself, scroll through the Q&A and thumb up any questions that you really like. And those are the questions that will get asked that have the more thumbs, that's democracy. Um, so Brooke, I'm gonna to come to you with a specific question now. Um, so a couple of years ago at COP26, uh, when it was in the UK, I went to COP26 as a delegate for London and I had very mixed feelings. And in one way it felt very, very important. And I still feel that because in some ways it's the only show in town. And in other ways I saw from inside those kind of conference halls with deep flaws within the system. Uh, we're coming up to COP28. Do you think the government are going to stick by the bargains or the deals that they've made previously? And how much does COP matter for domestic policy? Yeah, thanks so much. And I sort of resonate with that, having previous my uh, previous working life being spent uh, focused on COP negotiations and spending many hours in those halls. Um, so yeah, it's interesting seeing the the turnaround of the UK's attitude to COP28. It sounds like there's now going to be five current or former UK prime ministers. Um, I recently heard that we can expect to um, see at COP, which I think means we're likely to see the UK painting itself as a climate leader, um, which is interesting following a year where they really haven't been acting um, as climate leaders with the rollback of net zero policies and their plans for fossil fuel expansion. Um, we saw the emissions gap report uh, come out out this week, which showed that the UK is less likely to meet its NDC under the Paris Agreement based off existing policies um, compared to last year. Um, so I think, you know, that that's not a good sign for following through um, on commitments. We also haven't seen them holding up their end of the bargain on the commitment from Glasgow that was um, in the Glasgow Climate Pact around phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. Um, we had a windfall tax introduced last year, which was um, excellent to take some of the profits um, that companies were making um, and help support households meeting energy bills. Um, but unfortunately that included a very large investment allowance loophole within it. Um, and as a result for the coming years up until this tax is out of place at COP28, um, we have UK taxpayers picking up about 91% of the costs of oil and gas um, developments. And the value of that loophole based on data that we saw coming out today in the autumn statement is around um, 12 billion. Um, so, with that being said, there, there, there could be some positive steps um, forward at COP28, um, and I hope there are. We might see the UK coming to support um, the step forward in language around the phase out of fossil fuels. Um, the things to watch out for there will be around if there's any sort of loophole words baked into that. So you might see, for example, that they only support um, unabated fossil fuel phase out, or it may be what we've had in the past has been an issue around whether you're supporting phase out or just phase down. Um, are you just talking about fossil fuel use? Or are you talking about fossil fuel production and use? So those are all the, the sort of um, the devils in the detail there. That's what we'll have to look out for. But um, hopefully the UK will support a step forward um, on that in that sense. Um, and I think if language on fossil fuel phase out was agreed, it would it would send an important signal for domestic policies around the world. It's always hard to predict what ripple effects that will have um, and what decisions would come from that. But it would certainly be a step forward. Um, and hopefully the, it is designed in such a way there are not too many um, loopholes to get out of it. Of course, if we have a change of government, that could also um, change how that language is picked up in a domestic policy sense. Thanks, Brooke. And I think on change of government, it really feels like that general election starting gun really went off today um, with that autumn statement. And it, you know, we do know that a general election is coming. 
And ultimately, when we look at those COP conferences, it really matters about national representation and the green voices influencing both the government of the day and the national conversation. And we know that the way to do that is to get more Greens elected. And the reason why I'm saying this is to get more Greens elected, we do also need cash. So we're going to drop a donate link um, in the chat. I know for some people right now in the cost of living crisis this is very difficult and that's totally understandable. But if you can donate even just a small amount or set up a direct debit, all of that will go towards helping get more Greens elected and ultimately Greens in Parliament making that argument both on environmental justice, social, racial and economic justice too, is how we change that national conversation. Uh, that aside, Liam, can I come to you? Because I know you wanted to come in this on a global methane pledge. Yeah, thanks. And I think um, just to briefly echo what Brooke's been saying and, and others as well, I think I don't think the government at the moment is particularly interested in the COP um, or in, in green issues in general. I think we, we've seen that. Um, but I'd hoped that perhaps they would at least um, pause on some of the, the, the most uh, damaging um, uh, policies uh, until the COP is over, uh, in, and I'm thinking about the offshore petroleum licensing bill that they've they've promised to bring forward. Although I've now heard rumours that it it may come during COP, which would be uh, deeply embarrassing for us as a nation. Um, but but we'll see. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak a little bit just about the global methane pledge, which is one of those um, pledges that that came forward at COP 26 in Glasgow, um, and now has 150 signatories, um, as in 150 countries have, have signed up, including the UK. And the aim of that pledge was to reduce global methane emissions by 30% uh, by 2030 compared to 2020 levels. And just very, very briefly, methane is a, an extremely potent greenhouse gas, 30 times more, more powerful than carbon dioxide um, over a 100 year time frame. And we, we absolutely must uh, cut methane emissions if we have any hope of staying um, below 1.5 degrees or, or, or certainly of, of not overshooting uh, 1.5 degrees. Um, but even that 30% goal uh, is probably not enough. Um, uh, but perhaps this pledge can help galvanise some action uh, and, and then it could be considered a, a partial success. Unfortunately, again, the government uh, of the UK it, it seems completely disinterested in methane. Um, they tend to want to celebrate past successes um, of, of reducing methane emissions in the 90s and early 2000s, which was mostly from the closure of coal mines, which, as we know, is not actually motivated for uh, by climate reasons uh, at all um, and it's bringing very little to the table domestically uh, in, uh, and sees its role as more of encouraging other countries to, to clean up their emissions um, so there's there's more to be done there and, and I, would, I would just very briefly plug our recent um, reports and, and briefings from Green Alliance that came out earlier this week on that topic. The other thing I, I would just like to mention is, is loss and damage um, and the, the loss and damage fund which um, it, it's really brilliant to see that this has made progress and, and finally been agreed. And of course, we should pay tribute to um, a champion of the entire concept of loss and damage, um, the late and great Professor Salim Hook, who sadly died um, last month. I think generally the, the concept of climate reparations is an immensely divisive subject um, in terms of global climate negotiations. And I think, it, but I think it's impressive that developing countries um, have managed to drive this forward um, and, and find some agreement, um, and though of course it ought to be uh, much bigger and better funded than it is already. Um, so but I think it's worth sort of celebrating that, but, but calling for more as well. Whoops, I think Zach might have frozen, so yeah, I'm- Thank you, Liam, and I know you're not a politician, so I'll give you direct permission to uh, pop your um, briefing in the chat as well. Yes. Oh. Odd internet working. Over to you, Natalie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I was just leaping, leaping in. You froze on my screen for a second. Um, just briefly to um, very much agree with Liam about the loss and damage issue. And um, this is a huge issue of global justice. Um, and the people who are suffering most from the climate emergency already now have done almost nothing to contribute to it. And it's also an issue if we think about the state of the geopolitical world. And again, with that green holistic approach, you know, I do work on Ukraine, um, I do work on Palestine, and I look at the, the whole situation of how the world is looking at, broadly speaking, the West. And um, they're looking at the West very cynically and getting a decent loss and damage fund and that fully in operation is absolutely crucial for the state of the geopolitical world if we're going to actually stand up for the rule of law, for human rights, for the 
for the international system that has to be part of the whole story but what I was just briefly going to say is I mean I've been I'm not going to UAE um, and I didn't go to the last one a, in Egypt but um, before that I went to quite a run of cops starting with Marrakesh and one of the things to to look out for is if you're watching sort of seeing cop happening you'll mostly see reported in the mainstream media the official cop uh, that's the blue zone where people are sort of you know spending if it's spending three days uh, burning the midnight oil, uh, negotiating over two slightly different words in brackets and deciding which ones are going to end up in the final statement. There is also at COP, the whole, what I've called the shadow COP, it, it's associated with its lots of meetings of academics, lots of activists, particularly Indigenous activists. Um, and if you're following COP, try and look around and look for that shadow cop where there's lots of really exciting meetings, lots of discussion, lots of ideas are developed and bred. I've seen this happen over periods of time where things start in the shadow cop and four or five years later, they go into the mainstream official cop. And so just to give one example, in um, Glasgow, I chaired the most amazing event, which was run by the campaign to create the International Offensive of Ecocide. And we had a speaker, young woman from the Brazilian Amazon, who was just utterly gripping in talking about her experience, her perspective of the climate emergency. And the audience was just utterly hanging on her every word, despite the fact that it had to be translated. And, um, you know, I was chairing and I had everyone at the back going, stop, stop, stop. And I'm just going, no, no, everyone just wants to keep listening to her. I'm not going to stop her. Um, so when, you, when you're following COP28, look out for that, that shadow COP, the NGOs, the Indigenous speakers, they'll be out there, sadly, because UAE is human rights quite questionable. I suspect a lot of it will be online, but that also means it's going to be accessible to anyone to, to watch for. So look at the NGO feeds, look at that, you know, if you look at the COP28 hashtag, look for some of those non-official things and you'll find some really exciting things happening there. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I see I've got a message in the chat from Tony Cook, who is the co-convener of the Climate Emergency Policy Working Group, and he's asking if all the questions that have been put tonight that don't get asked can go to the working group, and they certainly can. For those who don't know how the party works, our policy is made up by our members. It's one member, one vote. So anyone or any working group can come up with policy and then we each have an equal vote. Another reason to join the party. But just to say thank you very much to the working group for all you do to inform our policy. And finally, before I move to the next question, uh, someone's asked about other previous talks. There's been lots of these talks. So they're all available on YouTube. I know me and Natalie did one on proportional representation. Me and Maria did one on a fairer taxation system. There's other lots, uh, lot, other lots of good ones that we weren't even involved with, but they're they're all there to watch. Um, Ria, we've been talking about how the people who are least resilient to deal with the climate crisis often face the worst brunt of it. How can we make sure in this just transition, moving away from fossil fuels, we can make sure that we're protecting the most vulnerable and essentially bringing communities with us and working alongside them? Yeah, I think this is such an important question and really kind of comes to the heart of what we as Greens are passionate about in terms of being able to help everybody um, who who does need uh, support in terms of energy, I call it energy advice or fuel poverty. Um, so I think one of the first starting points kind of is about understanding the data and understanding who is fuel poor or energy poor in your local area. So what are your local needs? Um, so thinking about things like how the multiple deprivation index kind of maps onto your local area. And there's lots of different resources out there. There is um, a map for London, for example, that you can see how the, the multiple deprivation index maps onto uh, the whole of London. There's also other organisations who have produced more specific reports. So thinking about Community Energy London, for example, who have done recently uh, a really good report on retrofitting, um, which councils could look at. Um, and then thinking about kind of partnership working, because you really need to be able to work with people to be able to, to connect with communities and create a proper meaningful change. So with within the council, for example, who are they working with um, that exist outside? So Croydon Council, for example, are they working with Croydon Community Energy um, and other um, projects that exist within London? Um, and then also thinking about um, there's kind of this in what Natalie was saying about that that telling that story of transformative politics so people are the planet and people and planet are so intrinsically linked that we need to be able to tell that story of why it's so important that everyday people have access to energy and um, warm healthy homes and 
kind of connect it to people's everyday lives because if people are um who are more likely to be feel poor probably have less time um less uh, energy after their working day to to read long documents being able to tell the story is really important and connect it to people's everyday lives as to why energy um poverty is an important thing to be talking about and the solutions to energy poverty um can also be uh, solutions to things like the cost of living crisis so um, thinking about insulation and retrofitting etc um, and then in terms of uh, your local council for example they could be doing things like signposting to other people so if they don't have the facilities themselves I know that there are local councils who have done really good projects on community energy for example I know Hackney has done some good work um, I know that other other boroughs in London I'm based in London that's why I keep talking about London um, but I'm sure there's other examples uh, across England and Wales. But if they don't have that capacity, how can they then signpost to other organisations? So again, making sure that they are working with community organisations who then probably have a better relationship with communities on the ground um, as a better resource to kind of connect with them. Um, and then there's this massive piece around training and skills and um, making sure that we are working to with educational facilities, colleges, universities to um, provide locally skilled jobs, which then kind of feed back into the community across kind of construction, transport, manufacturing, whether that's, you know, retrofitting things or uh, installing heat pumps, etc. Um, and then when you think about community energy, kind of when being able to articulate I guess the benefits of community energy and and why local people should be keen to to get involved in community energy and I guess that falls to the community energy projects but um kind of talking about how when we do have community energy projects the kind of additional uh, money that is left over can be fed back into the community and stay in local economies and that kind of circular type of investment um for the local communities um but going back to my first point, I think what is really key is understanding who is fuel poor, who is energy poor and how um, where do those people exist um, in your local area? How can you connect with them people specifically? Because, um, yeah, kind of not everyone in your in your local area is going to need the support, but there will be more areas, um, more specific areas that might need to support um, if they have populations with older people, for example, um, lots of children, um, people with health needs or disabled people, um, those kind of uh, communities that might need extra support in terms of, uh, yeah, energy advice. Thank you so much. And this will be my last plug of the evening, I promise. But I'm currently doing a piece of work with UCL around gender resilience. Um, I'm working with women from all around the world, uh, putting together a report to, to see how uh, the climate crisis is disproportionately affecting women, but particularly that intersectionality. So black women, disabled women, et cetera, and just making sure that that intersectionality is covered. So really good to hear you talking about that work for um, my final question, I'm going to come to Liam, first of all, and then I'm going to go to audience questions. I want to put a caveat on this question. So, Liam, I want to ask you about what individuals and communities can do um, to tackle uh, the climate crisis or to end fossil fuels. But this is something as a Green Party politician, the media asks us all the time, you know, what can one individual do? And the journalist George Monbiot calls it MCB, micro consumerist bull nonsense. I, I won't say what he calls it. Um, so it would be great if we could get that distinction in there that this can't be on the individual consumer to to change the whole system. But are there things that individuals and communities can do that aren't just consumerism? Yeah, I think I think it's great to have that caveat, Zach. And I think um, you know my personal kind of theory of change on all of this is is you need everything. You need individuals. You need communities. You need policy, and you need companies and and, and the private sector to do to do everything. So. Um, yeah, and there's there's obviously limits that that any one individual or community can do, but I do think there are there are good examples, and I suppose I, I won't talk about all of them, and others might might chip in, but I think as individuals, um, that there's there's some sort of really easy things that we can do um, if we're committed to to make changes. So um, people talk a lot about cutting down um, consumption of meat and dairy, <clears throat> and that that's a real um, driver of methane emissions, which I mentioned earlier. So um, so that's that's an obvious one. I think supporting green organisations, uh, either financially or through through voluntary action, um, is is a big one. Um, and and for those who can afford it, and um, there will be some people in the room, I'm sure, who can. 
some of those bigger changes, um, I think, can can make a big difference to our sort of personal footprints, if you like. So whether that's switching to EVs or or heat pumps um, or retrofitting our, our homes, we, we need to do those things. So let's do that where we can afford to. And I think the, the other side of it, though, is, is political engagement. And um, I, I think if people haven't, then they really ought to try to meet with uh, a, a, and influence their political representatives and let them know how you feel, whether that's your local councillors, um, elected mayors or uh, MPs. Unfortunately, I think many politicians are still a bit out of step uh, with the public when it comes to their position uh, on, on climate. And, and so it's, it is down to us to, uh, I think at a minimum, write to them and tell them how you feel um, and what you, what you would want to see. And if you can try and meet with them and ask them what they are doing and how you can help to, to, to drive uh, acceleration and further ambition. So it's that, I think, I think they do need lobbying in a sense um, from, from us as individuals. So that, those are my, my two key things, but others may well have, have more to say. Thanks, Liam. That's really helpful. And it's always good to hear someone talking about meat and dairy. And I just want to shout out the work of Plant-Based Treaty, who have been working with green councillors uh, all over the country, uh, putting in motions to look at moving towards a more plant, uh, plant-based diet. Um, Natalie, can I come to you? Well, just on that point, actually, um, I we have to mention this is Antimicrobial Awareness Week, uh, Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week, and AMR um, is something that I think will be what will stop factory farming, and factory farming that supplies so much of our, our meat and dairy is essentially food waste, a um, whole lot of issues there. But actually, what I wanted to say, relevant to the question, was that um, I sometimes meet people who... Um, particularly they, they say they're trying to give up plastics. They're trying to stop all the plastics in their life. So yesterday they cycled an hour and a half each way across town to try and find a, a bottle that didn't have a bit of plastic lining underneath the lid that sealed it. And it always makes my heart sink slightly because imagine you'd spent those three hours um, setting up, you know, a local campaigning group, uh, or working on supporting a local community energy group or something, how much more impact could that be? Um, I think that politics should be what everyone does not have done to them. And by doing politics, getting together with your, your neighbours, your workmates, your colleagues, your friends, your classmates, you can actually collectively have far more impact than one person on their own with the kind sign of consumerist uh, my origins, the accent comes from Australia originally, so I'll say it, the consumerist bullshit. Um, uh, and so really focusing on people getting together and making a difference. And of course, you know, one of the ways you can do that is through green politics. So I'm going to put one more little advert in there, which is uh, Carla Denu was just sitting in the office. I've been um, talking to you from having been doing a big media round through the day for the autumn statement. And she's, she went over to an event at the house. Uh, but I'll be down in her territory on Saturday in Bristol for an action, big action weekend. Um, and these are chances if people are listening who don't know about these. You know, we're looking to elect the next generation of green MPs. And coming along to a day like that, maybe you haven't, you've never done door knocking, never done leafleting, don't really know much about how, how politics works. Come along to a day like that. You'll have lots of fun and find out about it. So, you know, do politics, whether it's electoral politics, Green Party politics, organising a litter pick, that's politics too. Get involved, get together with others, and that'll have much more impact than your individual consumerist actions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, Brooke, I'm going to come to you in a second, but Natalie's also set me off that I know you and Carla have just filmed a video for the 50-50 campaign, and I went to Parliament last night uh, to join many female MPs to talk about the importance of Ask Her to Stand. Uh, this is the point that there's not enough women in politics, and whether that's ideally standing for MPs or councillors or even just being involved in the party. Um, it's really important that we're always reaching out to, to friends and colleagues. Um, I would say it doesn't matter if they're, they're a man or woman or non-binary, everyone needs to know that they're good at something. So please do support your friends. But I think it's particularly important that we lift the voices up of, of women and make sure that they feel that politics and, and is uh, genuinely a space for them and where they can make a difference. Uh, Brooke, so back to the question. What can individuals and communities do uh, to help the transition away from fossil fuels? Thanks, Zach. Um, yeah, so on this question, I want to make a few specific plugs. Um, I think there's some specific campaigns that it, um, it would be excellent for people to join to get involved. You can join the Stop Rosemont campaign um, or the Warm This Winter campaign to give a few examples, and there are many other um, and on those websites, at least you can sign up for events on, that will help you and like lead you through how to get involved. Um, similarly, 
you know, on the Women's Switcher page, there's a list of actions, um, how to email your MP and that sort of thing. And I would really echo Liam on the political engagement point, um, like calling, emailing, meeting with your representatives to communicate your concerns really makes a difference. Um, and then I would just also say that I think everyone has their own uh, set of strengths and passions. Um, so I would really advise people find where those things intersect with what needs to be addressed and then focusing in on that. We all don't all need to do it all. Um, and I truly believe that everyone can make a valuable contribution. Thank you so much. That, that was brilliant. Um, I'm going to come to to audience questions now um, that, that have come in the chat. Um, the first question I'm going to come to rear on actually um, which is how does one galvanize those politicians in denial? This is from Rosalind Kent. I guess another way of asking the question is, you know, what do we do about those people who just don't get it? That's a really good question and really important way of uh, kind of, it's a really important question because that's how politics works, right? Um, so my first response is lobbying. So if you think about um, all of the lobbying that MPs must get from fossil fuel companies, if we can even try to counteract that to a certain degree, um, we'd be able to have so much more influence. So Brooke has um, explained some uh, or mentioned some campaigns that you can get involved with, but a lot of campaigns do have explainers um, and kind of uh, reports and things that you can send across to your MP or your local councillor representatives and say have you seen this there's this new report that's come out today this could um help do why um and yeah really trying to connect with your politicians um, and being able to meet with them and um, kind of have that face-to-face -face interaction so that they can put a, a face to that email that comes through um is that's going to have more influence if possible um so yeah really pushing to meet with them and if you can get a group of people within your local community who are passionate about the same issue and um go along to to meet um with your local representative that would be great um if you as Natalie was saying, can get together a group of local people, there is power in that collective um, group there. So there is more power collectively um, through lobbying and through organising, through campaigning, leafleting, all of these things um, than any one person can do. So if you can rally up some friends or people who are passionate about the same issue, um, that would be a good starting point. Thanks. Uh, Natalie? I um, just want to say that I think it's good to take a moment to reflect on how far we have actually come from the lobbying, from the pushing, um, pushing extremely reluctant people. Now, my fellow Green peer, Jenny Jones, she's been in the House of Lords 10 years, and she talks about hearing lots of climate change denying speeches in the House of Lords. I've been here five years, and I've never heard an explicitly climate change denying speech. There is no longer the political space that the House will regard it as acceptable. There are still lots of people we know are, who are climate change deniers in the house, but they will start to talk about how it's too expensive or we're trying to go too fast. They won't actually climate change deny anymore. And that really sh shows that we've closed down political space. And I do have to share the story that um, Lord Callanan, who's our um, minister uh, for, for energy and net zero in the House of Lords. And I see him every time he grits his teeth and kind of clutches, crunches his fists and goes, yes, I entirely agree, and this government is on track for net zero by 2050. And he really doesn't want to say it. And it's quite funny that, um, you know, the House of Lords is usually quite a polite place, but lots of independent peers have been saying to Jenny and I, gosh, Lord Callanan's really rude to you, the two Greens. And my theory on this is that um, he really blames us for forcing him to have to stand up there and say, I agree with net zero when he really hates the whole thing. And that shows you what happens. People as politicians can be forced by public opinion, by public understanding into doing things because they know they have to. And so, you know, the more pressure we can put on the sort of things that Rhea was talking about, um, that pushes people who even aren't in their own head in the right places, forces them to act the right way anyway. Thanks so much, Natalie. I'm, I'm actually going to stick with you for the next question because it's both about the Green Party and it's about democracy. So it makes sense to ask you. Uh, so there are a number of UK organisations campaigning for a National Citizens Assembly on the climate emergency. Does the Green Party support this? Um, well, first of all, it is worth noting for those who don't know that there was actually 
a very good climate assembly held back um, in um, early 2020. Unfortunately, it coincided with the um, the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. And so it kind of got rather buried and it went it had to go online. And so it, it didn't have the impact that it might have had in different circumstances. Um, the whole idea of that kind of deliberative democracy, direct democracy is something the Green Party very much supports on all levels. And one of the things I would say is that you don't necessarily have to just do this at the um, national level. Um, I'm thinking of just one place I happened to visit where just one or two green councillors were able to secure in Kendall um, uh, in Cumbria a local climate assembly to discuss local climate action. So this is something that green councillors, um, and of course there are 30 councils around the country which we're either running or part of as a result of the real explosion in the number of green councillors in recent years. So this is something that we can certainly do at a um, local level. Uh, and I think it's something that certainly we can think about looking at this at a national level. Certainly, it's worth going back to revisit that. And if you look at the um, the French example, it's a, it's a really classic one. The French held a really good one a couple of years ago, which said that they should ban all flights um, where the train journey took less than four and a half years. And so often climate assemblies and, and people's assemblies are braver than politicians are. Um, the, the politicians only brought in a rule for two and a half hours rather than four and a half hours. So yes, I think a national climate assembly would be a good idea, good idea, but have a look around and think about campaigning for one in your local area where you may well have Greens in administration or Greens on the council who can actually deliver it for you at the local level. And just um, and not to go on too long, but I was on in Shropshire last Friday, the National Association of Local Councils. So that's looking at town and parish councils. And there's a huge amount of brilliant climate stuff um, on the energy side, on the nature side happening in that town and parish level. So let's make this happen at all levels of government. Everything doesn't have to be national. We can do so much at the local level as well. Thank you, Natalie. And the very brief story I'll share is that um, when I was first elected to the London Assembly, my first public meeting with the mayor, I asked the mayor about a citizens' assembly uh, for the city. Uh, the idea of bringing people's voices inside inside the chamber and into City Hall. And the mayor's response to me was that I've been elected by millions of people and I should be careful I wasn't in danger of making myself redundant. Now, I'm not saying that to bash Sadiq Khan. Yeah, I think he's often one of the better politicians on climate, actually. But I think that sometimes the culture we're facing from the other parties is that very top down kind of politic engagement. Um, Brooke, I'm going to come to you next um, on the next question, which is from Daniel Bartle. Daniel says, are we establishing to people the benefits of alternative fuel sources beyond just the environment, ensuring even people who don't care much about the environment have a reason to be on board? Thanks, absolutely. And yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think it speaks to some of the themes we, we picked up earlier as well around the fact that the case for moving away from fossil fuels to renewable energy and an efficient energy system goes far beyond the environmental benefits. And I think it's important to couch it in those terms so that people can understand that this isn't a scary change. This is a that, that if we do this transition well, you know, this can give everyone um, cheaper bills, warmer homes, um, and, and you know, cleaner air. Um, so it's crucial that we look at it holistically. Um, also, you know, you know, because climate justice as a as a term is it's it completely interlinked with social justice, um, environmental justice, racial justice. These are all you can't you can't separate these things. Um, if we think about it from like a cost perspective, I think it's um, quite clear what we've seen with sort of the war in Ukraine and sort of on. Um, I think we may see again with the conflicts now and. Um, in, in Gaza is the these conflicts can drive up fossil fuel um, prices and then that in turn drives up bills because um, of these volatile fossil fuel markets and so we can insulate people from those risks by um, having a greener energy system um, that that draws from renewables instead. Um, we can also sort of see huge health imp um, impacts from fossil fuel extraction sites um, and so we can have healthier communities as well by moving away um, from fossil fuels. Um, there's also, we can talk about the, the sort of jobs um, and, and opportunities it brings um, for communities as well. Um, so that's part of the, sort of the narrative. Yes, we may be seeing a, a scale um, down and decline of um, fossil fuel jobs, um, but there's also huge opportunities to expand um, new, new green jobs as well. Um, so I'll leave it there, but yeah, I think it's a very good question and, and making this case in a holistic way is really essential. 
Thank you. Um, Liam, I know you want to come in on this question about alternative fuel sources and how to get people who don't care about the climate to care. Yeah, I think I think just to to echo really and to, to reiterate that I don't think as a as a movement we've done this uh, perfectly effectively so far. I think there's scope for improvement in terms of um, selling the benefits beyond um, the environment uh, because um, many of those benefits are more tangible to people. I think um, so. Whether it's costs, whether it's clean air, whether it's health, whether it's um, resilience, uh, whether it's community, all of those things. Um, are more tangible, I think, to people than a, a healthy environment. At least it's harder to recognize what a healthy environment is until you have an unhealthy one, um, shall we say. And although, and, and, and it's, it could get a lot more unhealthy than, than what we have at the moment. Um, so yeah, I just, I just think we, we, we do need to think more about that. And, and it's a really great question to, to, to prompt us to, to think about it. I, I, I think, um, there are, but there are so many co-benefits um, in, in this area, and whether you, you know, especially in terms of air pollution, especially in terms of of health, um, and and especially for for older people as well. So um, there's loads of scope for this, and I think you know we we can we criticise the, the current government a lot for um, their recent rollbacks on net zero, but some of what they some of their kind of logic um, does make sense in that there's there's a a drive towards not burdening people with the costs of the transition that they're only sort of gently on board with and if you if you lump a big bill in front of them they'll probably be less on board with so there there is some sensitivity there that we do need to work with um, and so yeah I just want to say it's a really good question and it's on all of us to, to keep to keep thinking about it. Thank you, Liam. Um, I'm going to move to the next question just to say to anyone watching, there's 20 minutes left. So this is probably your last chance to uh, upvote any questions that you particularly want to see answered. Um, the next question is a pretty huge question. Um, I'm going to paraphrase it slightly, but but hopefully get it in there too. Um, I tweeted out today uh, following a report that we're on course for even three degrees centigrade. Um, as a politician, you're always trying to, well, one more than anything, tell the truth but to also get that balance between not presenting things in a way that, you know, we've lost thing, things are too bad because that paralyzes people to fear, but also you don't want people to live in a state of complacency. And Hamish Riddock's question is suggesting that 1.5 degrees of warming is baked in. And I think the crux of his question is, what are we doing to tell the truth and how can we push harder on this issue? I'll come to you first, Liam. Yeah, again, it's, it's a really good question. And I think you, you mentioned it, Zach, that balance between the truth and um and and just complete despair and and doomerism and um uh, yeah, and really frightening people into inaction which is which is quite dangerous I, I would push back a little bit on on the claim that that 1.5 degrees is baked in um I think nothing is baked in until we until we reach it and even then uh, things can change and and one of the frustrations I often have with um you know, uh, let's call them academics or analysts or people who are less connected to the politics of, of all of this, when they say, all the models agree, we absolutely need this technology, or we absolutely can't hit this target or that target, it's not, it's not um, feasible. There, that might be very well true based on the models and the assumptions that are being made. But as soon as you make that statement, you're shutting down all of those other avenues of imagination, and of, of a really radical uh, political choices that 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 do still exist and it, it's absolutely fine to argue that they're highly unlikely and nobody will ever agree to do them but and but if you shut them down without acknowledging that those that more radical um uh, uh, action exists then you do a disservice to all those people who are working on those those things um and and you you shut down some of that imagination as well so uh, so i don't think 1.5 degrees is baked in and if we um, if we were to reach um, net zero, and I mean geological net zero emissions um, today, tomorrow, next year, then we would see um, the end of warming uh, at least for, for the time being. So we whether or not it, we think it's baked in, I think um, yeah there is this there is this challenge on us to try and communicate in a way that's truthful and effective, but not um, frightening people into inaction. So that's a really important distinction. I'd also just add that even when things are baked in, and I agree that that's not necessarily true, every point degree, billions of people live in that gap, and, and it's incumbent on all of us to do everything we can all the time. And Natalie, can I come to you on, on this issue of telling the truth? 
Um, well, following on from what Liam said, I mean, it's really worth reflecting that history is not pre-written. It's made by the actions of people. So we don't know how it's going to turn out because it depends how people act and what people do and what our politics looks like. And if you remember back to um, <clears throat> those early months of 2020, um, we had the emergency of the COVID pandemic and the world changed just like that. Uh, and people were commenting on, gosh, you know, I can hear the bird song and the air smells different. And there was an enormous change in how things operated. Now, of course, we've gone back to many, well, and what many means all of the same things as they were before, but it demonstrates that things can change very quickly when they really have to. Now, at current rates of emissions, we've got about six years left um, to stay below 1.5. And it is worth looking at, this is a two-stage process. When we're currently in the El Nino weather system meteorologically, and we may see a temporary 1.5 associated with that, but that's that won't be a, a permanent 1.5. Um, and um, it's also worth looking at what happens in politics and how politics changes. I mean, I think when I first joined the Green Party, I thought, you know, slowly and gradually you nibble the way and things change. But I've actually now realized that politics changes in big jumps. The Overton window of what's mainstream practical politics can change really suddenly. So the last real change we had in British politics was the rise of Margaret Thatcher, Reagan in the States. Um, and that really changed the whole understanding of how British society worked, what normal politics was. What we've had since then, Blair, the child of Thatcher, Cameron, the child of Blair, I won't even comment on what um, uh, Boris Johnson was, uh, but um, we've been stuck in that paradigm of neo-thatcherism, neoliberalism. It's clearly broken. We're going to create now the paradigm for the next few decades in the coming few years. We know there's enough resources on this planet for everyone to have a decent life, for us to look after everybody and care for climate and nature if we share the resources out fairly. And so that's the model of politics which can take over the world. I'm not saying it will but it can, and that's what we've got to aim for. Thanks, Natalie. Um, moving on to the next question, we've got a question from Mark Marty. Mark says proposals for new build houses are still being permitted without any renewable infrastructure. To end our domestic reliance on fossil fuel, new build houses should be carbon neutral at minimum. Ria, how does party's policy tackle the housing need against new builds being non-fossil fuel reliant and carbon neutral going forward? Yeah, I think this is a really good question because there's obviously a massive housing need in the country, but at the same time, we need to be working to tackle the climate crisis and reduce uh, carbon emissions. And so I think it was earlier this year, maybe April time, um, that the Green Party uh, launched the call for a campaign in the government to sign up to this right homes, right place, right price charter um, to both tackle the housing crisis, but also ensure that green spaces are protected whilst we are able to build housing. And so um, working with councils and the national government, the aim was to ensure that people have both the right to kind of rent um, and both the right to buy, both rights to rent and buy kind of wherever the need is for them. Um, because often in areas, housing is built um, completely unsuitable for the local residents. Um, in Croydon, for example, we've seen um, in my ward, lots of shiny new high rise buildings being built, which to some degree are needed. But a lot of empty properties are being left in them because there's not enough family housing in, in them or they're not affordable enough. Um, and so we've got this housing crisis but at the same time that there are so many properties that um empty that could be being uh, used. And at the same time, um, we've got homelessness on the rise as well, which, um, yeah, you've got multiple crises going on. Um, and so to tackle that, um, I was mentioned earlier, kind of building to a passive house standard. So a low carbon emission standard um, would be really, really key to this. Um, and then, but um, if councils or uh, the government isn't doing, predominantly councils aren't building new housing, um, then working to retrofit um, previous um, buildings um, through heat pumps, um, air pumps, things like that. Um, putting solar panels on 
the the roofs um, of suitable buildings as well and working with community energy um, projects to uh, facilitate kind of them working with councils and on council owned properties um, to 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 you know uh, either retrofit or put on solar panels um, on the on the buildings. Um, yeah, I kind of went went slightly down the community energy route again. That's fine. It's like none of these things are in silos, are they? They all any, any conversation really comes comes back to to the exact same conversation. Um, so I'm going to move to the next question, uh, which is from James Bentley. James Bentley says, and I, I didn't plant this question, I promise, I personally believe that voting reform is currently the biggest barrier to instigating real change at a governmental level. Would you agree? And if so, what can we do to help bring about a move to a more proportional system as soon as possible beyond just signing petitions which go nowhere? And my instinct says to go to Natalie on this. Now, I thought you might. Yes. I mean, to mention the brilliant organisation Make Votes Matter, which I we, we both work with uh, an awful lot. And they've got some very good stats on showing how proportional representation actually democratic countries perform better uh, in climate action than do um, first past the post majoritarian type systems. Um, but how do we get there? Well, um, Make Votes Matter did a huge campaign and got the Labour Party uh, to vote at their national conference to back a uh, proportional representation system. Uh, so Keir Starmer has made it very plain that he has no intention of doing that. But it is worth looking back decades, and it was actually Labour Party policy, official Labour pol policy, to bring in proportional representation. Um, and um, they didn't do it when they got elected. So I think the only way we get PR is we actually build the public drive, as I was talking about the public drive on action on the climate emergency, so that, the you know, and if you went out and did it on the street in Westminster now and did a survey of 100 people and asked them, do you think our politics is broken, uh, you would get a almost 100% yes, I believe. And it's very easy to blame individuals, you know, the Boris Johnson, the Rishi Sunaks, the Liz Trusses for the state of the country, and I do, uh, but actually we have a broken system across the road from me, Westminster hasn't been significantly changed since women got the vote, and that was 100 years ago. So um, we need to build public demand to say we want a democratic, functional, working constitution that gives us a decent government. And it's patently obvious that our current constitution doesn't do that. So it's building that public awareness that the system is broken um, is the crucial push to make sure that we actually finally get to having a democratic, modern, functional constitution. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and all I want to add to that too is, although the system is absolutely broken, we've proven time and time again that even under first pass for post, we can and do win. In fact, in the Green Party, in just the last few years alone, we've over quadrupled our number of councillor seats. And in fact, since the last general election, we've doubled them. So we've proven we can do it at local level. We also know we can do it at national level. That's how we got Caroline Lucas elected. And that's how we're looking to get Ellie Chowns elected in North Herefordshire, Adrian Ramsey in Waveney Valley, Sean Berry in Brighton Pavilion to hold Caroline Lucas's seat. And of course, Carla Denya in Bristol Central. So the way you can get involved with, with fighting that system or challenging that system is by going along to one of those action days we were talking about earlier. So absolutely agree with every word Natalie says. We need proportional representation. And the question is quite right. Andy, even under the current system, we can and do win. And the next question feels very topical. It's from Joanne Fleming. Joanne says, war is the biggest obstacle to tackling climate catastrophe. What is being done to stop the military industrial fossil fuel complex from continued war for fossil fuel resources and profit at the expense of a future habitable planet? Just to give all the guests uh, time to just consider any answer. I think the thing I would answer is that I'm really proud of the stance we've taken, particularly on what is happening in Israel and Palestine at the moment. We're one of the first parties to call for a ceasefire. And we have been resolute in saying that violence can never uh, lead to anything but more violence. And ultimately, what we really need to be doing is working towards a world that is uh, full of peace and diplomacy and cooperation and moving away from a world of war. I still accept, though, the question is about when you still have a military complex that is still very carbon intensive. Uh, so, Liam, can I come to you, first of all, uh, with any answer to war being the biggest obstacle? Yeah, a really important question and a really a tough one. And, and I have to admit, not um, something in my area of real expertise or anything that we work on at, at Green Alliance, but um, but absolutely critical, and I think, um, also critical from the the angle of you know what can we expect to happen in a world that is uh, one and a half two degrees or three degrees warmer than than we would like it to be and and um, as with many of these these kind of topics and areas there's a synergy between 
uh, mitigation or reducing emissions or avoiding climate catastrophe and uh, resilience or adaptation at, at, at the other end or, or impacts um, if we fail. So um, I think it's a really good question. I, I, I've always um, found Naomi Klein's writing on the, this subject really valuable and, and, and can recommend that to, to folks. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it almost feels like it's not discussed because it's, it's sort of off, off there in a different world that's run by the, um, that, that, that military industrial complex. So yeah, great question. And I'm sorry, I haven't got a great answer, but uh, I think it's important to raise it. That's okay, these things are complex. I've got an indication from Natalie and then uh, Rear if uh, they still want to come in. Okay, aware, aware of time, just very briefly. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm proud of and that I bang the drum on whenever I can is the majority of the world's countries have backed a global ban on nuclear weapons. And that's something that I take every opportunity I can to raise to bring to the house. Um, there's a massive amount of resources going to nuclear weapons. Britain is talking about putting massive amounts of money into new, new, new nuclear armed submarines. Um, there's the AUKUS project, which is nuclear powered submarines involving Australia that I also get the chance to, um, to, to, to get out and stand out against quite often. So standing up against that military industrial complex Things like um, arms exports to Saudi Arabia, is some, which is which is an enormous quantity of materials. Um, those are issues that the Green Party is very much leading on. So it's a matter of getting out there and speaking out out on those issues, and we very much do. Thank you, and Rhea, I know you wanted to come in too. Yeah, just to add, so the arms industry is a multi-billion pound industry and it obviously relies on a lot of economic support and political support, but it does have massive impacts on, on the climate through, I mean, direct emissions during the conflicts, through the production of uh, weaponry and indirect emissions that come from, from that, and then also indirect emissions that come from things like the loss of vegetation and the uh, delivering of humanitarian aid during conflicts. Um, that could ultimately be avoided if there were no uh, war going on. But I did just want to do a quick plug for campaigns against the arms trade, who do an amazing job of campaigning against arms trade um, and is definitely a place to kind of go for more information on, on arms trade overall, but um, it links to climate change. So I'll pop a link in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's bringing us to the end of our session now. I just want to give a very brief moment if anyone wants to come in with uh, anything they think's not been talked about tonight that's a really important part of a piece around transitioning away or how we move away from fossil fuels. I know that's a very open wide question, but we've got about 60 seconds, so I thought I'd give a chance for anyone to say anything. Liam. Yeah, something that's, that's occurred to me that I don't think we touched on in this conversation and that, that I think does always come up and and again, I haven't got a good answer for, but it's the role that the media plays uh, in in shaping conversations, um, not just around climate, but around uh, so many political issues. And um, uh, and I'm always asking others, how can we break the, the deadlock that sort of corporate media has over our collective and narrative and understanding of so many issues, but particularly in climate and environmental issues. So um, great if other panelists have, have thoughts, but I think, um, yeah, let's not forget the role that the media plays in, in all of this. It's a really important point and then Natalie wants to come in. Um, following on from that, um, we passed a, a, a um, policy at Green Party Conference about um, high carbon advertising. And when we're talking about, me about media, you know, one very much big side of that is advertising. And, you know, that uh, picture of the SUV, the four wheel drive, you know, you know, the video of it being splashing through mountain streams and climbing over rocks that actually it will just be sitting in a suburban street in a traffic dram threatening all of the other more vulnerable road users and using up vast, vast amounts of fossil fuels. So tackling that advertising is part of the media story. Thank you so much. Um, it's good to end on there on a positive note too, the difference that Green Party members can make by bringing up policy at conference that then gets represented on the national stage, whether it's uh, through our MP or whether it's through our peers or whether it's all our elected councillors around the country. I just want to say a huge thanks uh, to all our guests uh, this evening. That was an incredibly insightful conversation. Um, and yes, it will be posted up on YouTube if there were bits that you missed that you want to watch again or you wanted to share. And just finally, I wanted to say thank you everyone for tuning in. As I've said, please do join the party. If you don't feel like you're quite ready to join the party yet, for whatever reason, that's fine. We do also have a Green Friends scheme. A Green Friends scheme is just a way of giving a small monthly contribution 
that shows you support the party, um, but without actually joining yet. Although, of course, I would encourage you to join. Um, you can also donate to us. We also take those one-off donations or regular donations. All links to get involved are shared in the chat and will be sent to you by email after this event. And finally, just then that will help us end the use of fossil fuels. We have teams working across the country for November's big national action weekend, which is taking place this Saturday and Sunday. My colleague Julie will post the details on how you can sign up to join them in Bristol, Brighton, Herefordshire and Waveney Valley in the chat box. So once again, thank you very much. Uh, let's go get Greens elected. Thank you. <laughs>